Welcome back to the main stage, everyone. Thank you again for carving out your time to spend with us at the Risk Five Global Forum. I'd like to welcome you back to the keynotes, and I would like to also extend my deep gratitude and appreciation to our sponsors at Platinum Level Western Digital, our gold sponsors, Cloudbear, IAR Systems, Adacore, Open Hardware Group, and Huawei. Our silver sponsors, Coven, NSI, TEXE, Qualcomm, and GigaDevice. Thank you so much for your generosity. Without your help, we would not be able to host such a fantastic event spanning 18 hours in the entire globe. Thank you. Sit back now, relax, join the chat, take full advantage, visit our sponsors, and enjoy the keynotes ahead. Thank you. Hello. This talk is going to document the milestones of the first decade of RISC V. Then we're going to figure out where the new center of RISC V is on this wide planet. I'm going to then tell you about the Rios Lab and our new project, the Pico Rio, that's going to drive the Rios Lab. I'll give you my vision of what I think we want to happen in RISC V in the next five to 10 years. And I'll tell you about a new video that we've been building to celebrate the 10th anniversary of RISC-V. So setting the stage for RISC-V was the PAR Lab and the RAMP project. The PAR Lab was intended to advance parallel computing, and it was from 2007-2013. This was funded primarily by Intel and Microsoft and some other companies. And an associated project with that was the RAMP project, the Research Accelerator for Multiple Processors that uh, started a few years before that. That one actually collaborated with Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Texas, Washington to share infrastructure to do our parallel architecture research. It needed a common ISA, but we couldn't agree on one as group. Spark was open, but it was only 32 bits and the 64-bit one wasn't. Open risk was open, but it's only 32 bits because I got to close the project that didn't have a good ISA. Well, that inspired us within the PAR lab to create a new instruction set architecture. And the, the email, the documents when we started was May 18th, 2010. And uh, six weeks later, we came to name RISC five. The next milestone was the publication that first instruction set manual about a year later. And this enabled outsiders to start learning about RISC-V, including Arvind at MIT, Kirsten's former colleague when he used to be there. In 2013, Nikhil of Luspec was in a meeting with Arvind, and that's when he learned about RISC-V. And he was excited about it. And just a week or so later, he implemented the RV32i instruction set in BlueSpec, the company we work in, but it was only two or three days work because it was only 40 instructions. He later met with representatives of the Indian Institute of Technology at Madras and argued for them to think about using RISC-V instead of what they were using, which was PowerPC. Now, he pointed out that the CEO of BlueSpec used to be the CEO of Lexra, which was based in the same city, and it was a kind of like an arm-like company of processor IP. But MIPS was able to drive them out of business for patent lawsuits. So he tried to make IT Madras aware of it. Maybe it wouldn't affect Madras, but it could affect other people in India. So on July 22nd of that year, the Shakti project, Shakti is Sanskrit for power, switched from PowerPC architecture to RISC-V. So that's when Berkeley just started to realize what was going on in the outside world. We thought we were doing for us and for some academics, but then we were contacted by Madras students that complained about making changes to the instruction set and why do you care? It's because we're trying to implement it. Well, that led us to talk to some people outside of Berkeley and realize there's this worldwide desire for an open architecture. First thing was to finish the RISC-V instruction set manual, the second edition of it, and then we started working on making it popular. So Krista and I wrote instruction sets to be free, the case for RISC-V. This was actually done 
published as a companion piece in Microprocessor the Report with some people from ARM who made the case for license instruction set. We were kind of hoping to re recreate that risk-sys debate from the 1980s. What happened with that is next we went to hot chips to try and promote RISC-V, tell them about an open architecture, all wearing matching blue t-shirts like the one I've got on, and then trying to recruit people to come to our first workshop, which was going to be the following January. Two things that we only found out recently, uh, Professor Benini of ETH Zurich uh, read the instructions should be free article and he switched his project. He had an open source project that was based on the Volpino processor. He switched it from open risk to the risk five ISA. And about the same time, Mike Aronson of Rumble Technologies, he was building a camera that had an FPGA with a MIPS processor inside. And he read that paper as well and decided to switch it to risk five and it just took him three weeks to do it. And that actually became the first commercial product to use risk five happened before the first workshop. That workshop was in January in Monterey. We had about 50 people from 20 companies. Interestingly, we thought it was originally gonna be popular with academics, but it was much more popular with companies because academics were kind of cautionary and wanted to see if it was gonna popular. The second workshop had many more people from many more companies in Berkeley just six months later. The first startup company based on risk five was incorporated the next month that was sci five and then the risk five foundation was incorporated with 42 companies the month after that and unknown to us at the end of that year nvidia decided to switch from their homegrown isa to risk five for all its gpus the following year andes which had been selling a homegrown isa called the v3 as an IP company, switched over to RISC V. And at the workshop in Shanghai, NVIDIA announced that its decision that it would ship all future GPUs would use RISC Vs on board, which is a memorable milestone for all of us. The following year, uh, Andrew Waterman and Yusef Lee helped revise my undergraduate textbook to go from MIPS to RISC V. The US DARPA agency announced programs based on RISC V uh, that they would be funding. And Microchip used the kind of signed the first purchase order to get a commercial IP for software for its FPGAs. And in 2018, there was lots of interest in RISC V in the community. They liked that it was open and it was a small instruction set, and there was a formal specification. That December, Western Digital made another major announcement. They were shipping 1 billion RISC V cores in all storage projects. Uh, Martin Fink, who was the CEO, remembers the impact of when the IBM CEO announced that they were going to invest a billion dollars in Linux and how that changed the landscape. He was trying to recreate that at one moment by saying a billion cores. And the following week, the European High Performance Initiative selected the RISC V instruction set for its development. As part of preparing the videos for the 10th anniversary, we interviewed all the RISC V pioneers, and I can explain now where some of these features came from. The first being free and open. Well, that came because at Berkeley, we were trying to develop an instruction set for use by other academics. So naturally, we kept it free and open under the Berkeley software distribution license so that anyone could use it. Now, what that means, now that it's being used commercially, it allows more competition, which I think is more innovation. And it also had this big impact for startup companies is they could pick the instruction set first and figure out the vendor later, where for proprietary instruction sets, the first thing you have to do is negotiate a contract with the company, which can take months as well as a lot of money. The second feature is keeping it simple. Well, since it was being developed for use, not only in research, but education, you almost always will subset a complicated architecture to explain it to the students. So that just became that core became the actual core. And what the innovative idea was that all software ran on it. So this makes it dramatically simpler. You can have a RISC V that you can port software to that's dramatically simpler than any other commercial instruction set. And there's many examples where that's made attractive to people. Given that you're going to run the whole software on that core, what that meant was another important feature is that it's modular. 
that the extensions were optional versus required. So this is a giant change in instruction set philosophy. In the past, because of concerns about binary compatibility, things had to be upwards compatible. That is, if one generation added instruction, all future all future generations also had to have that instruction, whether that was useful or not. That's not true for RISC V because of its academic roots, uh, that all software would run on that core instruction set. There were instruction set options that were optionally available. So something that gets added isn't going to be part of every computer going forward. It'll be there or not. Another thing, it was making it easy to enhance, basically to make it easy to evolve to let it uh, add its special purpose instructions. That was clear from the roots at Berkeley in the PAR lab. We knew that Moore's law was ending, Denard scaling was ending, that the future was going to be accelerators and we needed to have opcode space to do our research. So that was built in from the very beginning. For the cloud and the edge, computers of that era already had 32 and 64 bit addresses. The novel idea was 128 bit addresses. Uh, and that was the argument then was because we were thinking about warehouse scale computing. There were already uh, enough storage in the warehouse of two to the 50th bits. So eventually it would get up to 128 or get above 64 and the next power of two was 128. And then that's gonna you know, last uh, forever. But the only flaw that you can't recover from in computer architecture is the address size. And the easiest way to handle that is just double the size of the registers. So that is natural. And then community involving it at those first workshops, companies were interested, but said, if you're just going to keep it as an academic, we, we can't trust our company's future in that. Because typically what happens in academic research is after the graduate students graduate, you know, the faculty move on to something else. So inspired by Linux, the, and the Linux Foundation, we created the RISC V Foundation and eventually it becomes RISC V International and it owns the instruction set. And then another uh, issue that came up was security and trustworthiness, just what happened in the world in the last 10 years. Nation states wanted to be able to make sure that they had processor designs that they knew everything that was inside. So by having open architecture, that I mean, anybody could build it themselves and also because of open cores, you could see what was in it so there wouldn't be any secrets or trap doors. All right, that's a quick tour of the major milestones of this first decade. Where is the center of the universe? It's clearly North America, right? Uh, at the highest level of the organization, at RISC-V International, two of members are from the US. NVIDIA, sci five and Western Digital are very influential RISC-V companies. This is where Berkeley was, the home place of it. Rocket is a very popular open source core. As we mentioned, DARPA has funded actually two initiatives based on RISC-V. And there's the CHIPS Alliance Consortium and Open Harbor Group here in North America. And six of the summits have been held in North America and about a third of the members here. So clearly the center of the user, center of the universe for RISC-V is North America. No, it's Europe. RISC-V International is incorporated in Switzerland the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and ETH Search, they're very important to RISC-V are in Europe. Pulpina is a very popular uh, open source core for RISC-V. I told you about the EPI initiative, selecting RISC-V for high performance computing. Uh, there's the FASI Open Source Foundation that's been around one of the longest ones. We've held two summits there and we just had an election and two of the delegates are from Europe and a third of the members there. So clearly it's not North America, it's Europe. No, it's not North America, Europe, it's Asia. Five of the members of the highest organization are in Asia, Alibaba Cloud, Andy's Technology, Huawei, Samsung, all important influential companies. There's both Tsinghua University and the University of Tokyo. And in the city of Shenzhen, there's a government initiative providing uh, $15 million in uh, funding to set up a, a laboratory in Shenzhen around this five. There's consortia around this five in Shanghai and Beijing and other places. We've held two summits in Asia and about 30 of the members there. So clearly there's a great argument for all of them. So the bottom line is it's really a worldwide organization. 
there's more than 600 members in almost 50 countries all over the world. We have nearly 2,000 people participating in the various efforts to extend risk by. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. Speaking of a worldwide phenomenon, let's talk about RIPS-5 International Open Source or RIOS Laboratory. Its five-year mission is to make the RISC-5 ecosystem world-class. Uh, its nonprofit will judge success by technology transfer. He uses our ideas. Everything's going to be done in the open. We're going to try and build industrial strength IP, and we're going to consciously try to avoid patent lawsuits by uh, being careful what we build. The funding, as I said, comes from the city of Shenzhen. There's also going to be matching funds from companies, and they're also going to loan engineers to work on our open source projects. It'll be distributed around the world, but the majority of the engineers are going to be at TBSI. TBSI stands for the Tsinghua University and UC Berkeley. It's a joint venture in Shenzhen, and it's been around for several years. We're going to be one of the labs there. We're members of the Chips Alliance and the FOSI, and we're a premier member of the RISC-5 International. I'm going to be the director here in the United States, but uh, Zhang Zhi Tan, one of my former students, is an adjunct professor, will be a co-director, and another Berkeley alumni, Professor Lin Zhang, will be a co-director there in Shenzhen. How are we gonna decide which IP to build? So we, we first, we wanna have a project to drive it, and we also need to build harder to make sure that the IP that we're gonna put out there really works. So we decided that the Pico Rio project will do that. Pico Rio, and here's the logo for it, is a small board computer, but it's based on the open RISC-V and open cores. So it's like Raspberry Pi, but open using RISC-V instead of ARM. Our plan is every year to bring out a better version of increasing sophistication, and each iteration will use more open source IP and whatever low level software we have to bring. And eventually, either all of the IP or as much as we possibly can will be open source will be the gatekeeper of both the hardware and software and license it to make it low cost. So we're killing two birds with one stone, so to speak, figuring out a vehicle to make sure our IP really works and then providing a platform that's inexpensive for software developers who don't want to spend $500 to develop it for and be able to do that. Our target is to ship this in the first half of next year. Zhang Chi Tan is giving a talk about this at the conference and here's the URL if you want to look at the documentation yourself. Next up is my vision. So I, and like a lot of people, think in the next five to 10 years, we'll see RISC-V everywhere. Probably start with Internet of Things. Maybe the next thing will be going into the cloud, into the server room, and then eventually for phones and, and, and notebooks. But I think it'll be everywhere. But that's one vision. The other vision is around the open source, is that right now we're having these tensions in the world the information technology needs to be thoroughly globalized. Pieces are built all over the world, and this, these tensions are going to cause problems in our industry. I'm hoping that with uh, open source software projects and open source hardware projects, where people are genuinely collaborating with people in other countries all over the world, that that'll help reduce these tensions and, and make our industry more effective. So it's been 10 years, and we want to celebrate the 10th anniversary. Originally, we we're going to have a birthday party, but the COVID quarantine canceled that, so we decided to do a video instead. So I have interviewed about 20 of the pioneers of RISC-V from this first decade, and we've got a lot of different versions of what's going to be on the website that you can see there on the right at RISC-V.org. Have some of these pioneers explain RISC-V to a newcomer who's never heard about it, well, how would you explain it? Uh, what do these people think is the current impact of RISC-V in this year? And what do they think it's going to be in the next five or 10 years? Also, a long interview with the creators of RISC-V, Waterman, Lee, and Asinovic. I asked them about 20 questions, and, and there's about a one minute video in each of these about the motivation of RISC-V, rationale, and even details of the instruction set that you always wanted to know. We've also put those together in a single 30 minute video that's watched all the way through. Similarly, there's the timeline with milestones. There's again about 20 milestones and we talk to the people each of these milestones with about two minute videos there uh, for the first decade. 
and there's again they'll be concatenated together to make about a 15 minute one if you still watch it all together and finally for grander public consumption there'll be a short video that gives the highlights and about a 20 minute one to do that but you can find that online and who's the filmmaker of this well her name is grace patterson and uh it's not a coincidence she's my granddaughter so thank you very much uh, enjoy the conference and uh i hope to, you'll enjoy the the video celebration of the first decade of this life. Thank you.